You can tell who's the more social side of the room. That's okay. Um, hey, I want to thank you because, uh, again, when we, when we gather together, it's not, it's not merely for the, the sake or um, just because we need to hear each other sing, although we do, and we need to, uh, we need to hear what God has to say, what God has to say from the scriptures. Um, and prayerfully, we do that every single Sunday. But we also, when we gather, there's so many different aspects to a worship gathering uh, or a service. Um, there's aspects where we, we do need to take some time like we did this morning, and we're going to in the next service as well, and we're going to dedicate these young children to God. We're going to ask and pray alongside uh, these families. We're going to do things like we did this past Sunday where uh, just seven days ago we celebrated uh, nine uh, people coming forward in believers' baptism and to take that step. And um, we're go- we do things like uh, we spend time together out on the patio. We also, we also give. That's not, part, uh, that's not a separate part of the worship service. That's part of what we do. We give back to God what belongs to him anyway because everything belongs to God. And I just wanted to take a moment. This is not to ask. This is to thank. This is to thank you, church, uh, for your consistent and your faithful generosity. You have been so faithful to give on a consistent basis that we're able to do things. Like Rob was mentioning earlier, we're able to bless people across the world. And we're also able to do that across the street. Our local missions partners, our global partners. And even when you give, you know that you're gaining, as he said, you're gaining an opportunity to be attached to God's work all over the place. You are, as a result of your faithfulness, attached to every story that came through that baptismal this past Sunday. You're attached to these families who are going to walk out of here knowing that their church family is with them and blessing them. And so if you haven't taken that step of obedience to say, God, I want to give back to you because I want to gain. Giving is gaining. You're gaining the opportunity to be blessed and have a chance to be a part of what God is doing. If you've never done that, there's ways to do that all over the place. There are boxes in the back of the auditorium. You can drop your physical gift in there, which so many of you do every single week. You can set up a recurring gift online on our website, or you can even text to give. You can give on our app. There's all kinds of ways uh, for you to do that. Not This is not me asking. This is me just um, making available to you a great opportunity. So uh, it's part of what we do when we gather. It's part of what the family does. And there's so much to celebrate. So if you, uh, and we're going to get right to it. If you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, go ahead and grab that. If you don't have an actual Bible, there's some scattered around the auditorium in the backs of these chairs. You can grab that and open to Philippians chapter 2. So Philippians chapter 2, we're back in the letter to the church at Philippi this week. While you're turning there, again, I want to add my welcome. Say hello to everybody in the room. If you're here for the first time or the first time in a while, which so many of you are, it's so great to meet all these new people. But, you know, I know what you're thinking. Like, everybody seems new to you. You've only been around here for a few weeks. But, um, no, there's so many new faces on a weekly basis basis. Thank you. I can't wait to meet you and to hear your story and to hear how and why you ended up here and and what our church can do to come alongside you and serve. If you're not able to be in the room but you're joining us online, thank you for taking some time to connect with us today in this way. uh, We're grateful that technology exists that we can gather together. Um, I'm glad you're doing that. But this uh, this is not a disclaimer. All right, I don't do disclaimers, but this is more by way of introductory warning. Uh, Chapter 2 of Philippians, specifically the first few verses, are an unavoidable. This is, you can't miss this. I love working through books of the Bible, not just taking a piece here and there, like the famous verses, the coffee cup verses, the bumper sticker verses, the ones that you memorize. But when you work your way through an entire letter of Scripture, there are some things that you can't duck. Like you can't miss it. It's unavoidable. This is an impassioned call from the Spirit of God that we're going to hear this morning. There are some scriptures that inspire you, they comfort you, they encourage you, and there are also verses like we're going to read today that leave no wiggle room. There's no room for doubt when you read and hear these verses, but I want to say this. These verses that we're going to read in just a moment are not in the Bible to cause you dread or guilt. God does not use dread or guilt. He doesn't shame you, all right? The Bible is not about introducing shame to 
anyone's story. In fact, I would say that the call of the scripture is to take shame out of our stories. That's why Jesus came to earth, to take away from us the shame that sin has beset us with. But uh, what do I mean when we say that what these verses are and what they aren't? This is all I want to tell you today, is that you don't have to fear your dad's tones. You do not have to fear the tone of your dad's voice. I don't know if you caught it or not, but it was the only note that I made in talking about child dedication. And I wanted to remember to say it, so I wouldn't forget, is that we want to pray that when you dedicate your child here at our church, we are intentionally praying and asking that they would be caught in sin. Now that's strange. We're not asking, we're not asking God, would you help them to sin, all right? That's not what we believe around here, but we're praying that because uh, it's going to happen. If you're a parent in the room, you know, like, it's going to happen. My parents are in the room, and they will testify to the fact that sin happens uh, in every family, some uh, more aggressively than others. But anyway, so um, we pray that they would be caught in sin, that they would be caught in sin here. I didn't come up with this concept. I'm borrowing this line from a pastor friend up in the Bay Area. And I love the fact that we get to do that because when you are caught in sin in your family, we can do something about it. And we're not here to just rebuke and we don't add shame and we don't add guilt. But we pray that people, and this is for all of us, that when you're caught in sin here, we come alongside you with grace. That we don't say it's going to be, it's, it's okay, it's no big deal. We say it is a big deal, but this is not who you are. This is not who God has created you to be. This is not who you are in Christ. And the reason I bring that to your attention and highlight that is because there's something about your dad's tone. There's something about how he responds to and how he deals with you when it's time to gently redirect you. That it's more of an arm around the shoulder or a hand on the back of the neck than it is a stern voice. This is our king's tone with us. And the non-ignorable point of these verses that we're going to read in just a moment are the theme, it's the theme of humility. We're going to talk about humility. And humility is a tough one. I mean, would you like to, would you want to have traded this like weeks from this past week with me? I'm just thinking about, praying about, uh, just meditating on this concept of humility over and over again. And I know there are people who are listening to this, who are in the room, who are going to watch this later, and they're going to go, Brett is talking about humility? Okay, th th that's rich. Of course he, yeah, what else are you going to talk about? How to fly? All right, so, I mean, but humility is hard. Humility is a difficult subject to talk about. But look at me, humility is so crucial. Humility is so necessary and it's important and there are times when we have to look right at the scriptures and allow them to faithfully reflect the image of God and say that's what I'm called to conform my life to. So what if the most important Christian virtue was the one that you are least likely to talk about? That it fiercely tears apart at your ego but the moment you start thinking you've got it the moment you think you've attained this, then it flies away. Philippians 2 is going to help us see that humility grows in our lives as we look away from ourselves, we look outward towards others, and we look upward to Jesus Christ, who is our rescuer and example. That order is everything, by the way. No other religion would say that their God is humble. It's just us. Nobody else talks about their God in terms of humility, yet Jesus chose to be emptied of his rights so that we can be filled with his love. Big words, lots of implications. But here's my point over the next few weeks. The series is called One Another. And when it comes to one another, how we relate to, how we interact with one another, it's all about this one little phrase. It's so easy that everyone can remember it. As Christians, we have lots to do and nothing to prove. We have lots to do and nothing to prove. Paul makes his case for this in Philippians chapter 2, 
And I hope you found it by now. So we're going to read together beginning in verse 1. I want to read this to you. This is Paul continuing from Philippians 1. He says, so, this is after he's just established this huge magnum opus of what the gospel is. So after hearing the gospel, Paul continues. He says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, that is good preaching. Those are the only perfect words that you'll hear today, but those words are in the Bible because God has something to say to every one of us about our perspective. There's a perspective change necessary for all of us. The text is just gorgeous. It begins with these four, if there is any, statements. He begins by making four, if there is any statements. He starts by saying, if there is any encouragement in Christ. If there is any encouragement in Christ. If there is any encouragement in Christ. So what encouragement is there? What encouragement do we find? Do we have? Are we part of and participate in? What is encouraging about being a Christian? Well, in Christ, we have an advocate. Jesus is our encouraging advocate, the one who is constantly and consistently pleading our case before God. This word advocate, it finds its roots almost in a legal sense. And so I want you to picture the courtroom of heaven and you have a high, holy and exalted judge and there you are. And you're standing there and you know you don't have to read your list of offenses because it's written all over you. And you need a helper. You need an advocate. Someone who would consistently plead your case before God. That is Jesus. He is our advocate. In Christ, he's not only an advocate who we're separate from. He's a companion. There's an encouragement knowing that Jesus is with you. This is so true. Jesus is closer. You in the room. Watching online from the front to the back, Jesus is closer to you than he was to any person that he ministered to or interacted with in his time on earth. He is closer to you than the woman at the well. He is closer to you than Lazarus' family. He's closer to you than the one who reached out and touched the hem of his robe. He is closer and he promises this, this by telling us that he is sending us a helper and that it is preferable for the Holy Spirit, the reminder that Christ is with us and in us and all around us, as St. Patrick would say. The Holy Spirit being inside of us, Jesus tells us, is better than him being beside us. We are nearer to God than any saint who has ever lived. Any Bible character in the Old or New Testament, you are closer to God than that. He is your advocate and he is your companion. And in Christ, we have an intercessor. There's encouragement in Christ from the intercessory prayer. This is the picture. Again, think back to the courtroom. I love this quote from Dane Ortland. He has written that Christ's intercession. What is intercession? So that's, that's, that's saying on someone else's behalf. This is pleading someone else's case. He's written that Christ's intercession is the constant hitting refresh of our justification in the court of heaven. Over and over and over again, 
his perfect record of spotless righteousness is put onto you. And he's intercessing before God. He is pleading before God, not asking God to look at your record but his. This is Christ the encourager. The encouragement that you find in Christ is like water. The encouragement that you have in your Savior, your Messiah, your closer than a brother is like water that finds its way into every nook and cranny of every relationship, conversation, quiet, difficult, and sun-drenched moment. You are inseparable. So if there is any encouragement Christ in Christ, and if there is any comfort from love. This may seem introductory or even redundant because you've heard it so many times, but I have to tell you that the truest thing about you, follower of Jesus, you are loved by God. I don't, I don't want that to get old. You are loved by God. You are loved. By, and who is it that loves you? You are loved by God who called to himself a people and he made them his own. You're loved by a God who displays unmatched patience and forgiveness for his children. By a God whose hands are both strong and sensitive. A God who takes your face into his chest and whispers, shh, and he doesn't mean shut up. God brings you into himself and he whispers that, reminding you to find quiet for your soul in his embrace. You're loved by a God who promises peace that surpasses understanding, by a God who binds up the wounds of the brokenhearted, and you are loved by a God who said, you are blessed when you mourn. You are blessed when you are persecuted. That's the God who loves you and he provides real comfort. The comfort is not just intellectual. This is a prayer I've been praying recently. Is that you would not only understand that God loves you, that you would feel it. So if there's any encouragement in Christ or any comfort from love, or if there is any participation in the Spirit, if this is true, participation in the Spirit is commonly known as communion. Not communion that you take once a month here on Sunday morning, but communion that you share with other Christians and with other believers. This is known as fellowship in the Spirit. And the way Paul uses this phrase, if there is any participation in the Spirit, he's not talking, again, comfort from his love, that's feeling. That's how you feel. Like there's a feeling that comes from the embrace of your Heavenly Father. So Paul uses that phrase, if there's any comfort from his love, and then he switches over and he says, if there's any participation in the Spirit, not subjective feeling. This is not talking about, do you feel like the Spirit is in your cup? This is not what he's saying. This is not about intimacy with God. This is about intimacy with one another. It is the church of Jesus Christ's corporate relationship with the Spirit of God. He's talking about participating together. That's why it matters that we gather together. It's why you need to be here in the room. It's why there's something missing when you're missing. This is not to the people who are not here. This is to you. That I need you on Sunday morning. I need you out on the patio. The people in your small group and your family, they need you to show up. Why? Because if there is any participation in the Spirit. So picture, again, this communal meal. Picture this communal meal that you're called to, but you have skipped out and you've walked up to your favorite taco shop. Your favorite little walk-up stand, your favorite little sit-down place. I don't know where it is, and you need to tell me because we're still looking for places to go. But So picture... Picture your favorite taco place. You walk up and you tell the person who's making your taco, you tell them every ingredient that you want and every one that you don't. All right, so I'm going to have some chorizo, some extra guac, lime crema, onion, no cheese. All right, so that, and you're telling them exactly what you want on it. They're making it for you. You take it and you don't stand and eat it right in front of them because you're not insane. 
Like you actually take the taco that this person has made for you and you walk away and maybe you go grab a picnic table or you go back to your car and you go and enjoy it by yourself. This is not communal eating. This is not, this is not a community idea. It's a self-serve. It's a quick, I want what I want, so I'm going to show up and get the things that I want and say no to the things I don't want to say yes to. I want to get that. I'm going to be served. I'm going to be fed. I might be full, but you haven't had a meal. There's real deep significance to sharing a meal with, with a, another person when you're passing the dish. And when you're passing the bowl, when you're passing one element and another. I, one of the things that I've been so blessed by is, is getting a chance to sit down with so many of you in your backyards and in your kitchens and in your dining rooms. To sit around the table with you and your family is, it's a sacred act. We're not just, we're not just filling up the tank here. And what Paul is doing by saying if there's any participation in the spirit, the kind of participation that Paul has in mind is this idea of like a communal meal, a great feast where everyone is invited. You gather around the table in one another's presence. And you're brought into relationship. You're brought together. You're called together by the one who provided the feast. That it's the Father by the Son through the Spirit who's making what's happening around the table possible. You were asked to be there. So if there is any participation in the Spirit, and then if there's any affection and sympathy. If there is any affection and sympathy. You know, C.S. Lewis wrote a really interesting book, and it's, it's one that's not gotten as much acclaim as his others, but the book is called The Four Loves. And if you haven't read it, I would really commend it to you. It's a great read, and it talks about different kinds of love that the Christian is actually built for, that you're built for relational love, you're built for romantic love, you're built for friendship love, you're built for church love. And in, in this book, The Four Loves, he uses a word for a particular kind of love, and it's an affectionate kind of love. It's a type of affection that you feel by way of attachment. Like when something has experience built into it, when there's some memory involved, when you can think back and go, I remember where I got that. I remember what I was doing when I picked that up. And you can, you can have this type of affection. It's, this, is not, this is not high and lofty. This is not super intense romantic feeling. This is affection that comes through daily use, through daily interaction. It's familiar. You can feel this kind of affection towards a child, a dog, or even a favorite old shabby sweater. It's the type of affection that has some miles on the odometer. And the word that Paul is using here, when he says, if there's any affection and sympathy, it's the same word that he used in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, when he wrote this, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, that's affection. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. This is tender affection. It's especially reserved towards precious family members. So these are four questions. They're not just statements. These are four questions. But they're a, they're a specific kind of question. Do you know what a rhetorical question is? That's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> rhetorical questions. These are questions that you ask, but you don't want someone to answer. That's okay. But if you're asked a rhetorical question, do not answer it. There's possibility for humiliation. There's a possibility that you can ruin someone's day if you accidentally answer a rhetorical question. Trust me. Do not answer questions like, how many times do I have to tell you to shut the refrigerator door? That's a rhetorical question. I don't want my daughters to go, 17. <laughs> One more. 
when you are asked the question, what's the matter with you? Don't tell them. <laughs> because more likely, that's not what they're thinking. Or, can I still fit into this? Do not answer that question. I'm, I'm pleading with you. Of course she can. All right, anyway, keep going. All right, so here's what the author, this is what, he is writing this letter to his friends, to the community, to the church that he planted, this pretentious little colony in Philippi. He's writing and he's asking these questions in this section of scripture and he's using a grammatical device called rhetorical questioning. It's asked, but it's not meant to be answered. It's just for not effect, but to lay emphasis on the point that's about to be introduced or discussed. No answer is expected, but a thought is generally assumed to be brought to mind by rhetorical questions. So the answer to these questions that he begins Philippians 2 with, if there is any encouragement in Christ... If there is any comfort from love, if there's any participation in the Spirit, if there's any affection and sympathy, the answer to the questions is, of course. I mean, I've made my case. Of course there are those things. Of course that happens. Of course that's the result. The answer is, of course, but there's something deeper at work here. What the Scriptures show us by asking these rhetorical questions, is they are bringing forth not an assumption, but a plain, look at me, truth. And the truth is the pattern of the gospel. It's a beautiful pattern of the gospel in this entire letter. So we are, church family, We are the recipients of so much encouragement, of so much comfort and fellowship and affection and sympathy that it does, not can, it does change how we treat one another. How you relate to one another is the result of how Jesus has related to you. You have already received the gift of encouragement and comfort and sympathy, and affection, and participation in the Spirit. You are not waiting for that. That is yours already in Christ. Remember, you and he are so tight. You're one. You were the recipients of that. You've already received the gift. And so what that means for you is that our lives as Christians are just a humble thank you note to God in response to the gospel. Just humbly saying thank you. Just going, yes, all those things are true. And I I actually, I didn't earn my way into any of those. You just picked me. And if that is true, which of course it's true, then my response is just humble thanks. Just a humble thank you note. You know what's amazing about thank you notes? This is like why you drove down to church today. This is my, this is my deep theological take for everybody in the room. You don't write thank you notes to get presents. You don't write a thank you note before you get the gift. You don't earn a gift, or as my family calls it, a prize. You don't get that because your thank you note is so well written with such good penmanship, with such good grammatical use, and you even knew the difference between effect and affect. (laughs) The thank you note always comes after. Do you know what that means for you? Your lives are a response to the gift. Not so that you can get a good one. That's everything. All right, that's for free. Keep going. (laughs) So, what should characterize our lives more than anything else? Verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Or, as the old King James likes to say it, let each esteem others better than themselves. 
is an action. This takes something. The point is not what other people are. The point is not what others are. The point is what you count others to be. Do you see that? That difference, not just who they are, not just what kind of person they are. The point is not your expertise in being able to call out the type of person that you're encountering, that you're engaging with, that you're in relationship with. The point is not just being able to say, I know what kind of person she is. The point is what you count her to be. How you think about her, how you respond to her, that's the point. Will you count them as worthy of your help and encouragement? Not, are they worthy? But will you count them as worthy? This is our secret sauce, family. This is what we're known for. This is our calling card, that we count others as worthy worthy that's humility so that's great to agree with on a sunday morning this this is the text that preaches itself it's the sermon that that writes itself that is so clear cut and easy and not messy at all but i don't know i don't know about you but um sometimes the way that i actually go about all this stuff is a little different than how it's written out on paper so it's easy to say, oh, humility is just, it's what I count others to be, not what I think other people are like. It's what I esteem them to be. It's the honor that I give them. That's the point. But you and I live in a broken world. You and I live with broken people. And let's not pretend that we're that easy to love either. So how do we do this? How do we actually live with humility? Well, we look away from ourselves. Look at verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. We are told to get our eyes off us. This is the opposite of, do you know this word? This is the opposite of entitlement. To look away from yourself is the opposite of entitlement. Entitlement is the most dangerous ingredient. It's the most poisonous ingredient. It's the one ingredient that is guaranteed to sabotage your life. So I can't make any guarantees this morning or many promises that I know absolutely will be true, but I can say this faithfully, family. If you want to ruin your life, live entitled. If you want to ruin every relationship that you're in, act entitled. Entitlement, here's what it says. That's a big word. That's almost too big of a word for me, so I have to break it down. You know what entitlement says? You owe me. You owe me. And you know, ownership or feeling owed, it carries with it this connotation of debt. We know all about debt. I mean, five minutes in front of the television or reading the news, I mean, you know all about debt. And do you know what's true? I don't know if you've ever been in debt. I don't know if you are in debt. This is not a Financial Peace University class. This is not my place to say any of those things. But we know what debt collectors do. It's in their name. They collect debt. They make sure that what you owe is given back to them. Debt collectors are relentlessly committed to one thing. You know what that is? Getting their money. A debt collector is relentlessly committed as well. Do you know what, you know what they are really good at? Reminding you. They're great at reminding you. You're still in debt. You still owe us. You lie. You did not put the check in the mail. (laughs) I'd venture to say this. This has probably never happened. That a debt collector showed up to work one day, saw your name on his to-do list, looked at how much money you owed and thought, you know what, we'll give him a break. I, I don't think that has ever happened. They've never forgotten to make the call to tell you 
that you still owe us money and there's interest. I mean, there's a low-grade fever, right? You know it's coming. It looms every single month. You know the 10th is coming, and you've got to get the check in the mail. And we live in a world that is committed to reminding us of our indebtedness. That's what entitlement does. It reminds people that they owe you. You're relentlessly committed to reminding other people of how much they owe you, of what's due to you. Now, I want you to look right at me. In the day in way, in, in our day, in the age in which we live, it is easy as Christians, I know this, it is easy to feel pressed and afflicted. It is. Those things are very true. And we do currently, not a thousand years ago, I mean this morning, we have brothers and sisters in Christ, some of whom we support and you support financially, who are honest to goodness being persecuted. That they are not just risking a reputation, they're risking their lives to gather with other brothers and sisters. To be a Christian costs something. It does. And there will, not might, there will come a day when following Jesus means you have to take up your cross. But I say this as your pastor and somebody who loves you and is committed to telling you the truth. We are not owed anything. We are not owed anything. We are not entitled to anything. And do you know why? Feed your eyes. Look at me. Because we voluntarily associate with the burden of the cross. We do not look at ourselves or to our own best interests. We hide behind the cross. We associate with our Savior. We look away from ourselves. And we look outward towards others. Our, our eyes have to go somewhere. Our gaze has to be fixed on something. So if we're not looking at us, where are we looking? We're looking outward. We're not owed anything. But we're in debt to everyone. What do I mean by that? That is a heavy statement that I probably should have run by somebody before I said that. <laughs> we are not owed anything, but we are in debt to everyone. Let's unpack that just a minute. What I mean when I say we are in debt to everyone is this, is that we owe our family and we owe our friends, we owe our church and we owe our community interest. We talked about this a few weeks ago, but I want to avoid the financial metaphor that seems to be like running through the section of the sermon. I'm not talking about variable rates or a fixed anything. When I say interest, all I mean is this, what do you owe your family, what do you owe your friends, what do you owe your community, and what do you owe this church? You owe them this truth that what matters to you matters to me. You know why we don't, you know why we don't video family dedications? Because we need to see those little babies in the room. We need to see the fact that the, like, if, you, if you remember that time of all in 100% committed parenting where you don't get a single minute off, what matters most to those families who bravely stood on this stage this morning, what matters the most to them are those babies. And because they matter to them, they matter to us. Their future matters to us. It's, it's worth praying about. It's worth serving for. It's worth giving toward. Guys, I could have listened to Rob Gapper read that list of ministry partners and those people that we are supporting around the world. I could have listened to him go through every single one. Because it's amazing to think that we are a global body of brothers and sisters. And what matters to them, unreached people groups. What matters to them, seeing the gospel be born and grow up and flourish and flower and multiply. What matters to them, that matters to us. When I look at you, I don't just see you, I see your families, I see your stories, I see your histories, and I see God's preferred future for your life, and what matters to you, it matters to me, not because I'm a pastor, because I'm a Christian. You don't owe me anything. 
but I'm in debt to you because I'm your brother in Christ. What matters to you is what matters to me. That's the posture of humility. It's what Paul means when he writes, look to the interests of others. This is far more than just having an affinity. This is more than just being around. It's not less than that, but it is so much more. It's realizing that every single person that you meet has been on a journey, and chances are it's been a tough one. Talk to somebody this morning. How was your week? It's been a week. That's true for almost everybody in the room who's honest enough to raise their hand and go, yep, me too. Everyone you meet has been on a journey. Everyone you meet has been in a season. Everyone has a story to tell. And it's not an easy or pain-free season for anyone. It's understanding that we don't, church family, we don't expect unchristians to act like they're saved. We are not surprised by that. We're not caught off guard by that. When we look outward towards others, we see that there are people who are, this phrase is everything, not yet followers of Christ. And we pray for them. We beg God to rescue them because we know how great it is to be asked to have a seat at the table. We don't expect them to act like they're saved because they're not. It's understanding, it's realization, it's graciousness to look at the mom and the toddler in the line ahead of you at the grocery store and to ask the Holy Spirit in that moment, should I help? And this is, we have time. This is a brief aside, but I need you to stay with me. So this is very brief. Um, I've only been around Ventura for like less than two months, but here's something I've noticed. You know what's behind the eyes of every single person that I make eye contact with? Because I'm like a weird eye contact guy. You know what's behind their eyes? Anxiety. Anxiety about the finances, about the kids, about their marriages, about the sickness, about living in a constant state of fight or flight. And the reason I use the word anxiety is, is intentionally because anxiety is what you feel if you don't get what you think you need. And that, all those things, that, that long list, those are the things that matter to the people around us, the people in this church, the people within the walls, the people on our campus, and the people who haven't decided to call Encounter Church home yet. Those are the things that matter to them. And if it matters to them, as Christians, it matters to us. Looking outward towards others is seeing this, taking this to heart, responding in a way that is Christ-like. This is the one anotherness of Philippians chapter 2. Look away from yourself, look outward towards others, and do you know how you can do that? Do you know how you can keep yourself in that posture? It's not through writing a reminder to do that on your dashboard. It's not by becoming so disciplined or deciding all of a sudden that humility is the virtue that you're going to tackle in 2022 as some sort of odd New Year's resolution. The only way you and I can hope to live lives that are characterized by humility is when we look upward towards Jesus Christ. If you ever struggle with humility, yes. If you ever struggle with self-denial or serving those who are hard to love, think on this picture of Christ. This is what he did for you. Jesus is the great example of verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That's the picture of Jesus Christ. Verses 6 through 8 of Philippians chapter 2. Do you know what they are? They are a digression, an undoing, a reduction of entitlement. Verses 6 through 8 of Philippians 2 is the opposite of what entitlement looks like. This is the steps downward that Jesus took. He was in the form of God, but he walked away from the worship. He emptied himself. That means it cost him something. He took the form of a servant. That should stop our hearts. It's so amazing. 
it reminds us of the time at the Last Supper with Golgotha looming in the morning that Jesus having one night left on the planet. If you knew today was going to be your last day alive, what would you do? Jesus took the towel from around his waist and washed the feet even of those who would betray him. He took the form of a servant. He was born in the likeness of men. The creator took on the image of his creation. He humbled himself. This is volitional, self-imposed submission. This is Jesus submitting himself, humbling himself. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That matters. It means that humanity could, humanity could not create a way of murder that would intimidate Christ to the point of entitlement. We couldn't figure out a way to scare him from what God had called him to do. There was nothing that we could come up with, no scheme from the enemy, no power of hell could intimidate Jesus into entitlement. This is our king. This is our savior, our Messiah, our substitute. To make it as plain as I know how today, if you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus because he is the one who indicates something with his life, with his actions, with his words. This is Jesus telling you, if you've ever wondered what God looks like, look at me. If you wonder what God sounds like, look at me. If you wonder how God interacts with people that he loves, look at me. The life of Jesus is the example not for you to follow, but so that you might see who God is. He's indicating this is the picture of the Holy One. Jesus is indicating everything. How do you know what God is like? Look to Jesus. Before Jesus ever says, do like I do, be like I am. Before Jesus says, follow me, he rescues us. He's our rescuer. He is our substitute before he's ever our example to follow. Before you're ever given a single command or imperative, that means do this. Before you're ever given a do this from the Bible, the Bible tells you something that's already true of you. Translation, all right, we're going back. You are not asked to give before you receive. This is the undoing of religion. This is the undoing of religion. The way that you used to get to God, that you had to cleanse yourself in order to get presence. Now God's presence comes to you. It cleanses you, and now you get to live a life of humble gratitude. You don't get rescued and get relationship and get welcome before God because you start learning how to be humble. Not because you start learning how to encourage and how to comfort and how to be more affectionate, how to be more sympathetic, how to start participating in the spirit, whatever that means with other Christians. You don't get fellowship presence, you don't get encouragement, you don't get all the benefits from being a follower of Christ because you're good at being a follower of Christ. You become better at following Jesus because he gives you everything that you need. You have received all God has to offer and the natural reaction in your heart to that is just humility. Because what do you have that wasn't given to you? Nothing. This is the denial of the self-made man. No one ever got to the top of the mountain because he did it his way. This is the undoing of the religious process of thinking that you are somehow ascending steps of righteousness and that one day you'll get so holy that God will go, well, I guess we should just let him in. He's been banging on the door for half an hour. You don't climb up the ladder and get to God. You are laying at the bottom and Jesus climbs down the ladder to you and says, let's go. And so if that is true, if there's any encouragement to be found, if there's any comfort, if there's any affection, if there's any sympathy, if there's any participation in the Spirit, know this, you didn't get that, you received that. You didn't earn that, you received that. You didn't achieve that, that was delivered to you. Just because He likes you. 
He did not have to. He didn't owe us, but he chose us, every single one of you. We don't look at the cross of Christ and pound our chest and say, I'm so worth it. We look at the one that we have access to, that we can now enjoy, who told us everything we needed to know about our Father, and we say, he is worthy. It is painful. It is painful to take our eyes off ourselves because let's fa- it's just easy. It's built in. We're surrounded by things that constantly point our eyes back to us. That's hard. And I want, and just, I want you to know that I, I'm with you in this. The reason we even gather on Sunday mornings is to help remind each of us that there is still some spiritual navel gazing that I need to be trained out of. It's hard to stop looking at yourself. And it is hard to think about somebody else's, what they're interested in, what matters to them. If that matters to them, then it matters to me. That's so hard. But because Jesus has done everything that he possibly could have to bring you into relationship with God, he's achieved that for you. Then it's not, it is hard, but it's not impossible. It's not easy, but it is really simple. It comes from taking a moment every day and reminding yourself that he is the worthy one, that he is worth it. So I don't, I don't know about you, but there are, there are times when that's, that's easier to believe than others. There are seasons even when, just by the very nature of life and how it goes, it's easier to believe that than at other times. But just because something is easier or harder for me to believe, it doesn't make it less true. If it is hard for you to find real rest and comfort in the fact that all of this is true for you, just know that your wrestling with it doesn't undo one ounce of its power. It is hard to believe, but that's why we're here for one another. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you that, uh, that he came and lived a life that we could never live and died a death that we should have died and that now we get to know God. We thank you and we praise you. It's in his name. Amen. Would you stand up and let's worship together.